All right, welcome everybody. We're going to get started in about one minute. Um, Joel and Stephen, do you want to unmute uh, camera and video and test and make sure everything's working out for you? Looks good for me. Yeah. Okay. Everything looks good. Okay, excellent then. And uh, Stephen, you should feel free to go ahead and start sharing your slides once I start doing the introduction and then hand it over to Joel. You can begin sharing your desktop anytime you like at that point. Perfect, thank you. Great, yeah. So we'll get started in another 30 seconds or so. All right, let's go ahead and get rolling today. So let me begin by welcoming everybody back to the SMU Physics Department Speaker Series for Fall 2020. And we're continuing our November series uh, today with its theme of New Frontiers in Physics. And in a moment, I'm gonna hand things over to Professor Joel Myers to introduce our speaker, Professor Stephen Taylor. But before we do that, as usual, let me just offer you some reminders. So for the audience on Zoom, uh, we keep everybody muted to avoid the crosstalk overtalk problem that happens with uh, randomly unmuted mics on Zoom. So if you wanna ask a question, all you have to do is type the word speak into the chat window. Um, either Joel or I will notice it and we'll interrupt Stephen at the next opportunity, probably at the end of a slide in order to take the question and let you have a back and forth with the speaker. Uh, otherwise, you can wait until the Q&A at the end when the talk is done. And again, if you want to speak, then just type the word speak and that'll kind of put you into a speaker queue and we'll get your uh, question out in the order in which people get the word speak into the chat window. And just so everybody remembers, this is also being streamed live on YouTube. That's non-interactive, but welcome to our audience on YouTube. There are a couple of people connected there. And um, let me now at this point, go ahead and turn things over to Professor Joel Myers to introduce today's speaker. All right, thanks, Steve. So as Steve said, today we're very happy to welcome Professor Stephen Taylor. Uh, Stephen got his undergraduate degree from the University of Oxford in 2010. He followed that up with his PhD in 2014 from the University of Cambridge, uh, during which he focused on exploring the cosmos with gravitational waves, both from LIGO and with pulsar timing arrays. Stephen then went on to uh, be the NASA postdoctoral fellow at JPL, uh, followed by a postdoctoral fellowship, um, the NanoGrab Senior Postdoctoral Fellowship at Caltech. Uh, he's now an assistant professor at Vanderbilt University, where he joined in 2019. And he's a leading member in NanoGrav, where he holds several leadership positions, including uh, the chair of the Gravitational Wave Detect Detection Working Group. He's a member of NanoGrav's management team and also a representative to the International Pulsar Timing Array for uh, NanoGrav. And with that, we will pass it over to Stephen. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a it's a pleasure to to virtually visit and deliver this talk. Thanks for the invitation. Um, so, as my slide implies, I'm going to tell you about some new results from this this pulsar time and array hunt for gravitational waves. And I'd like to first lay out um, how this hunt for gravitational waves is different from what you might have heard before uh, from the LIGO collaboration. Uh, it's, it's similar in concept, but very different in scope and scale. Um, so I'll cover that uh, at the start. So I'll give an overview of the gravitational wave landscape and where this sits, and then delve a little bit into the kinds of objects that form a crucial part of our detector, and those are pulsars. Uh, then I'll move on to what we see as the target population of gravitational wave signals for our particular detector, and that's the most massive binary black hole systems in the universe. Uh, and then without teasing you further, I'll tell you about these new state-of-the-art results uh, and where we see them going in the next couple of years. So first of all, um, you know, when we first started looking up at the universe, uh, we had access to a very narrow range of wavelengths and that gives us access to a narrow range of phenomena. Uh, but over time, as our technology and our capabilities improved, so did our access and understanding of more and more phenomena. 
so as we expanded to infrared, microwaves, radio, X-ray, UV, and gamma rays, we could see the universe in lots of different ways. And the same is, is perfectly true for gravitational waves. So here is showing a little spectrum of gravitational waves in frequency space um, along the x-axis and then characteristic strain along the y-axis. The strain of gravitational waves is the strength of the waves, their ability to deform space-time. And up at frequencies that we would call the audible range, because if you translate to sound waves, they're in the human audible range, um, is where LIGO operates. And LIGO has been detecting systems of stellar mass binary black hole coalescences. So these are black holes and neutron stars that are similar in size to the sun, um, in spiraling and then coalescing together. So LIGO has been has been has become quite an industry at, at doing this and very recently put out a new catalog which had 39 new compact binary mergers, uh, which is just a phenomenal number. The, num the total number that LIGO has detected is above 50 at this point. So since 2015, uh, LIGO has been doing extraordinary work. But if you want to detect more massive black holes um, and different phenomena entirely, you have to do the same as we did in our ex exploration of the electromagnetic universe and go to different frequencies. So if we go to lower frequencies in the millihertz range, that's where the future laser interferometer space antenna will operate, hopefully in the mid 2030s. This is extending the LIGO concept to space where there will be three satellites um, spread by two and a half million kilometers from each other, uh, trailing the orbit of the earth as, uh, as it orbits around the sun. So this is a fantastic and ambitious concept, but it will be sensitive to black holes that are 10,000 to 10 million times as big as the sun. And these are the kinds of black holes that sit at galaxy centers. But if you want to measure the most massive black holes in the universe, you have to go to nanohertz frequencies, and that's where pulsar timing arrays sit. Pulsar timing arrays are sensitive in the range of a few nanohertz up to a couple of hundred nanohertz in frequency space. And we believe that in that sector lie supermassive binary black holes that are slowly coalescing together. Uh, these black holes are billions to tens of billion times as big as the sun. They are the most Large, they are the largest compact objects in the entire universe. And that's, that's what we're hunting. Now, a crucial part of this entire detection effort involves an astrophysical object itself, and that's pulsars. Uh, just to give a bit of context, pulsars are these rapidly rotating neutron stars that essentially act like cosmic dynamos. Uh, they have uh, very strong magnetic fields and um, along the magnetic field axis, they accelerate charged particles eventually producing electromagnetic radiation along that magnetic field axis. But there can be a misalignment between the magnetic field axis and the rotational axis, which actually uh, creates a lighthouse effect. As the pulsar swings its beam of radiation into our line of sight, we can register a pulse of radiation at our radio telescopes. And so that makes these perfect objects to time and understand. Uh, we can actually build up very sophisticated models of when these pulses arrive. And you're seeing that in this animation that every time the pulsar is swinging around, you get a pulse measured at the, uh, the radio telescope. Now, like I said, we can time these pulsars incredibly well and build up uh, sophisticated models of when we expect these radio pulses to arrive. And the models of uh, the arrival times of these pulses depend on the spin period of the pulsar, uh, how much the spin is changing over time, uh, these are objects that, to some extent, extract their, uh, the electromagnetic energy outflow from the rotational energy. And so over time, their spin is, uh, is increasing in period. Um, so we can factor that into the model. Other uh, effects that we take into account are astrometric effects, like where the pulsar is on the sky, and also the column of electrons that the pulses are interacting with as the pulses propagate from the system to Earth. So these are radio pulses propagating through the ionized interstellar medium. So um, lower radio frequencies will be, um, will be delayed more than higher radio frequencies. We have to model that and take that into account to de-disperse the pulses as they arrive. So we have lots and lots of uh, effects that we build in here to build 
uh, incredibly sophisticated models, incredibly precise models uh, of pulsars. We can build a precise model and then walk away from a pulsar and not look at it again for years and still come back and know which pulse is going to arrive. We never lose track of the pulse numbers. But what we don't take into account actually to lead in order are the influence of gravitational waves on the system. A gravitational wave that's transiting between the earth and the pulsar will change the proper separation between the earth and the pulsar. And so that's actually going to advance or delay the arrival time of these pulses. We get a perturbation and a timing irregularity if these gravitational waves are propagating through our line of sight. And that gives us a great opportunity to use these systems to measure gravitational waves. Now, unfortunately, we can't just use one pulsar. We're not looking for the best pulsar in the Milky Way and trying to time it to exceptional accuracy. That would be great, but we couldn't claim gravitational wave detection if we noticed some timing irregularities in that. That's because pulsars themselves are subject to internal physics that we don't understand and noise processes that we can still only characterize to some extent. So we can't simply rely on the time and regularity of one pulsar. We have to use another feature of gravitational waves and the influence that they have um, on the Milky Way. In fact, these gravitational waves are deforming the entire galaxy, which means that all of the pulsars in the galaxy will be suffering from similar effects. And so we correlate the timing information from as many pulsars as we can and look for correlated timing deviations. So we imagine ourselves like a spider sitting at the center of a vast galactic web, trying to feel correlated tingles in the web um, between lots of different pulsars in the galaxy. Um, and as a gravitational wave washes over our galaxy, it will create a model dependent uh, correlated timing effect in lots and lots of these pulsars. So that's the basic concept behind pulsar timing arrays. We're looking for correlated timing deviations caused by gravitational waves as they propagate through the galaxy. And the collaboration that I work most, uh, most closely with is Nanograv, the North American Nanohertz Observatory for Gravitational Waves. Um, we use the uh, Green Bank Telescope in West Virginia. We also use the Arecibo Radio Telescope in Puerto Rico. Um, we've had some uh, experimenting with the VLA also to do pulsar timing, but the two telescopes shown there are the, the dominant ones that feature in our, in our data taking. But we're not the only collaboration worldwide that's doing this. There is the European Pulsar Timing Array, and what's shown here are only a small collection of the radio telescopes they have access to. And there's also the Parkes Pulsar Timing Array in Australia. And the Parkes Pulsar Timing Array has been doing this for a long, long time. Um, and the Parkes Pulsar, uh, the Parkes Radio Telescope has um, a fantastic legacy of enabling science and radio astronomy over the past 50 years. In addition to these three major collaborations, we also have uh, nascent collaborations in South Africa, in India, and China. Um, the giant telescope you see in China is FAST, the 500 meter aperture spherical telescope. That is bigger than the Arecibo radio telescope. It's constructed in an entire valley floor in China. And we all work together within the International Pulsar Timing Array that's tethering together all of these different efforts uh, and trying to make our science more robust and also accelerate the science that we can do by fusing our data sets together. So now let me tell you what we expect at these frequencies that Pulsar Timing Arrays can probe. Pulsar Timing Arrays should be sensitive to uh, a range of frequencies that are set by how often we sample the pulsar time series. Um, if we collect a few decades worth of, of time and observations, then just by Fourier analysis, we can probe to roughly one over that total time span, uh, which gives us access down to a few nanohertz of gravitational waves. And then our highest frequency that we can probe is roughly set by um, our sampling cadence of the time series. And we typically go back to the same pulsar every few weeks to take another observation. So that gets us up to a few hundred nanohertz. And within this, this band of uh, a few nanohertz to a few hundred nanohertz, we expect an entire cosmological population of supermassive black hole binaries to be waiting for us. 
Um, and this is a pretty sure bet because supermassive black holes should pair up naturally within uh, the, the well-known model of hierarchical galaxy growth where small galaxies will merge over cosmic time to form larger galaxies. Um, in addition to that, we know that most galaxies have a massive black hole at their center. And so as the galaxies merge together, so must the black holes at some point merge together. Um, they will form some sort of dual system, which will then tighten and form a hardened binary system. And eventually over millions, billions of years, these black holes should merge together. So we expect that these, these signals should be out there just as a natural byproduct of galaxy growth. Now, the ways that those signals manifest in our range of sensitive frequencies um, is a little bit different from LIGO. So by and large, we don't expect the first detected signal in pulsar time arrays to be an individual binary system. Rather, we expect the first detected signal to be the background hum of gravitational waves from the entire population of binaries emitting together. So we're looking for a sort of a cosmological cacophony of lots and lots of these binaries uh, that we won't be able to individually resolve initially, but over time, the brightest and nearest binaries should rise above the level of that background. And we should be able to individually resolve them. So initially, all of the signals will just appear stacked up together and we'll be probing the statistics of that population from this stochastic signal. Uh, but over time, we'll be able to start resolving individual binaries out of that background um, as they resigned above that background. Now, another thing that I wanted to point out here is that pulsar time arrays will never really see the merger of two black holes. Um, LIGO, on the other hand, sees the entire in-spiral merger and coalescence and then sort of a settling down behavior of the final black hole. But the black holes that we care about have coalescence timescales of millions of years. So our, the signal is going to be present in our entire data stream and we'll never actually see the merger phase at all. We're seeing the black holes in the very early stage of their coalescence as they, as they eventually move towards merger. And while we'll never see the, the overall merger, the final merger phase, we can see an imprint of the merger process and that's called gravitational wave memory. That's shown in this right-hand um, panel here. Uh, we'll never see the oscillatory part of the merger, but we will see a little DC offset. It's sort of a constant offset in space time as, um, as black holes merge together. And this is a product of general relativity. You get this um, back reaction of the gravitational waves on space time that can create sort of a permanent dent in space time as a result of the black holes merging. This looks like a step function in strain. And actually, if we integrate it to get the timing irregularity signal, it'll look like a ramp. And so we look for correlated ramps in our signals as well uh, as a measure of this gravitational wave memory effect. Now, let me again emphasize what we're, what we're doing here and how we will claim a detection of impulsor timing arrays. We're looking for not just time and irregularities in one pulsar, we're looking for correlated time and irregularities across many pulsars. And there's a very distinctive signature that we're looking for. And the signature is called the Hellings and Downs curve. And it's what I have uh, over, over plotted here on this video. What this is showing is the correlation in the time and irregularities between two pulsars that are steadily separated by greater and greater angles in the sky. So this template of cross correlations in the timing deviations depends only on how separated the pulsars are in the sky. And it's got this very nice quadrupolar pattern where the correlation is first positive and then negative and then positive again. And there's nothing we know, no other noise process we know that can induce this kind of signature. There are other noise processes that can create similar correlated signatures that would be monopolar so on this diagram, it would be a horizontal line. And that would be if there were errors in our global time standard that are propagated through to our observations. Um, we can also think of processes that might be dipolar correlated. So it would look like a cosine on this diagram. That would be uncertainties in our model of the solar system ephemeris. Uh, the reason why we would get that uncertainty is actually because we have to reference our observations back to the solar system barycenter as our quasi-inertial reference frame for our observations. 
So if we don't know how to reference back to the solar system barycenter well enough, if we don't have accuracy in that, then we'll propagate uncertainties, which will manifest as this dipolar process. However, nothing we know of can produce this quadrupolar correlation between the pulsars. No noise, no other signal. Um, so this Hellings and Downs curve, as far as we know, is unique. And that's the signal that we hunt down in, uh, in pulsar timing arrays. And that's the signal uh, that would be created by an isotropic background of gravitational waves that's affecting an array of pulsars. Now, let me move as soon as I can to these state-of-the-art results that I've talked about. Um, and first give you some background of what we expect our detection timeline to be. Um, as I said, we expect the stochastic gravitational wave background will be the first signal we pick up. That's going to be a background hum of gravitational waves from the aggregation of lots and lots of binary signals uh, emitting together. We expect that will come within the next couple of years, actually, based on the, the growth in, in the number of pulsars we time, the sensitivity of our pulsars, and current population models of supermassive black hole binaries. We expect to be able to pick up this gravitational wave background signal within the next five years, but possibly sooner, based on the results I'll talk about. Um, after that, we should expect that individual binaries that are particularly massive or nearby could resound above the level of this background and be picked up as an individual source. And if we pick up an individual source, then uh, there's lots of fun stuff we can do there. We can try to localize it on the sky, characterize its orbit, try to associate it with a, an electromagnetic event, lots and lots of fun stuff. And I'll hopefully get to that at the end as well. So what are these new results? Um, these new results come from Nanograv's search for an isotropic stochastic background of gravitational waves in 12 and a half years of precision pulsar timing data. So this is a campaign that's lasted at least 12 and a half years so far. Uh, the analysis included 45 pulsars spread across the sky. And what we found is what we call a common spectrum process in our pulsars. There appears to be a very steep spectrum stochastic process that's in common across Nanograv's 45 pulsar array. Um, and that array has a maximum baseline of 12.9 years, which means that we're probing down to roughly three nanohertz or somewhere between 2.5 and three nanohertz. On the left-hand panel here, you're seeing sort of a periodogram of, uh, of this um, stochastic process that we've measured in our, in our array. Uh, the gray regions, the gray sort of vertical shapes are uh, showing the uncertainties in how well we've characterized the power at each frequency. Um, and if we try to fit a power law to that, that has 30 frequencies. So if we just fit a power law across all of these frequencies, what we'll get is contamination from higher frequency noise that is poorly characterized. And so what we do then is try to build actually an adaptive model that searches for a power law at lower frequencies and then flattens out to characterize this excess white noise muck at higher frequencies. Um, and this is fine because we're essentially low pass filtering our data, looking for a steep spectrum, low frequency signal. And this is what we would expect from a background of gravitational waves. We would expect a background of gravitational waves to manifest as this very long time scale low frequency signal that's predominantly red, which means at lower frequencies. So to characterize this signal, we just need five frequencies, five of our, five of our lowest probed frequencies in the array. In the right-hand panel, you're seeing the Bayesian posterior probability distribution of the amplitude of this common spectrum process. Um, and the different histograms are showing a couple of different analysis choices. Um, in one of these, the solid histogram, you're seeing uh, if we just choose to um, analyze with a fixed solar system ephemeris model. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we have to reference our observations back to the solar system barycenter from initial observation of the Earth. And so we have to use a model of the solar system that's produced by JPL, or alternatively, the French INPOP team that do a similar analysis. They're essentially taking legacy spacecraft data and even more re recent spacecraft data and forming a giant model of the solar system 
uh, with which we can compute the center of the solar system. Uh, once we do that, we take this model uh, to compute the Romer delay, the Romer delay being the classical light travel time across the solar system. And then that feeds into our analysis. So the solid histogram is what happens if we compute all of our detection statistics and this amplitude under this fixed model of the solar system. The dashed histograms are what happens if we assume there's some sort of level of uncertainty in the computation of the center of the solar system. So we, we apply a sort of little perturbations to Jupiter's orbit and some of the gas giant masses. And we allow those to be fit simultaneously with our noise modeling and our searches for gravitational waves. So we're kind of building our own model of the solar system within this search. And then as good Bayesians will do, marginalize over all of that uncertainty to get a robust answer at the end. Regardless, we get consistent answers. So whether we choose to use this Bayes FM model, this Bayesian ephemeris modeling, or just use the fixed ephemeris modeling of JPL, we get a consistent answer where the amplitude of this process appears to be about two times 10 to the minus 15, um, which is quite a large um, signal actually. Um, and it's only because we've been searching for so long that we can now probe into these lower frequencies where that signal starts to rise above the noise. I noticed there might've been a question there if someone would like to ask it. Oh, I was just reminding people that if they have questions, they can okay. just indicate that. So yeah, sorry for the interruption. No, no, not at all. Um, yeah, happy to answer any clarifying questions or, or questions on this. Now we can do an initial, uh, another analysis, sorry, which assesses how important each pulsar in our 45 pulsar array is to this result. Um, and we compute something called the dropout factor. A dropout factor is simply a leave one out cross-validation probability. Um, there are lots of different um, little dots on this diagram here, but it's best to focus on either the blue or the green. And what the blue or the green are, uh, is showing is the Bayesian odds ratio with which a given pulsar supports the common process that's found in the other 44 pulsars. So it's really how much each pulsar is propping up this common spectrum signal that's seen in all other pulsars. There are about a third of our pulsars that show strong support um, and, are and are supporting this process. There are then a large suite of these pulsars that are kind of ambivalent. Maybe they haven't been timed long enough uh, because this is showing up at lower frequencies. So we need good timing, good timing coverage of all of these pulsars. And then there are some pulsars that actually don't seem to support this process. Um, and we're investigating those with more advanced noise modeling to see if um, it's really a, um, a limitation of our noise characterization that's doing this. Um, but it seems that that could be the case in at least one of these pulsars, particularly the one that's um, towards the end here, J1713. J1713 is actually one of our best timed pulsars. And so it's peculiar that it doesn't seem to support our common process. And through rigorous analysis, we found that this pulsar actually has a transient um, dispersion measure feature at the end of its data set. So it's got a transient feature where um, a void seemingly appeared in the interstellar medium and uh, caused the characterization of its radio frequency dependent noise to change. And that has really affected its ability to support this process. If we simply chop out the, the chunk of that data that has this transient feature, then it does seem to support this common process. So it's possible that in the next few years, as this pulsar recovers from that transient noise feature, we'll start to support it even more and more. Now, what I've talked about so far are really spectral features. Um, and it appears we do have this very strong spectral process that is supported by lots of pulsars. Uh, but there's a reason why we haven't claimed the detection of gravitational waves. And that's because we don't actually have any evidence for the distinctive cross correlation pattern that gravitational waves would induce. Um, what you're seeing here, in the, if you focus on the left, first of all, are um, frequentist recoveries, best fit recoveries of the cross correlations between different pulsar pairs. And these representations are really a, a binned um, aesthetically pleasing version of the full 990 distinct cross pairings that we have in our array. And they're kind of all over the place. They, they're straddled around zero here, but they certainly don't show much evidence for a quadrupolar signature 
um, that is shown in the blue dashed pattern right there. Um, but going from the top panel of 11 years of data to the bottom panel of 12 and a half years of data does seem to show that we've got a tightening of the error bars. So we're moving in the right direction. And hopefully in the next few years, we will see this evidence start to pop out. In the right-hand plot, you're seeing the Bayesian equivalent where we're recovering the distinctive cross correlations that should exist between the pulsars. The Bayesian version recovers the similar result as the frequentist version. We don't have strong evidence, these cross correlations yet. Now that's not to say we're disfavoring the cross correlations. We just don't have enough evidence to arbitrate one way or the other. So the data is not informative of the cross correlations yet. Um, if we compute the Bayesian odds ratio for these Hellings and Downs quadrupolar correlations, then we get odds of about two or four to one in favor of the cross correlations. And in Bayesian odds judgment, that's not a lot at all. That's nothing to write home about. And so we have to wait longer in order to pull out any distinctive um, cross correlation evidence. And we also have a way of characterizing the significance of any cross correlation statistics. We, we measure, um, LIGO has a technique where it slides its data in time. So it looks for any coincident noise fluctuations that could make it seem like there's a, there's a correlated signal. We do a similar technique, but we call it phase shifting or sky scrambling. Essentially, we're looking to take our real data set, try to scramble any potential correlations that are in there, and then look at how often noise fluctuations alone can create such, such correlations and correlations that might be stronger than what we actually measure. And by our reckoning in, our, in this data set, there's a five to 10% probability that, um, that noise alone could produce cross-correlation signatures as strong as what we measure. So we have this steep spectrum process, but we don't have evidence that it's correlated between pulsars in the way we need in order to claim evidence of gravitational waves. What we do need in order to arbitrate one way or the other is more time. So we think that within the next couple of years, uh, potentially even data that we're putting together right now, um, we should be able to say one way or the other whether um, gravitational waves are favored here. So then let me launch into what detection could look like and what we could extract from this kind of detection of a stochastic background of gravitational waves. Um, this is sort of a natural breaking point. So if someone would like to ask a question, you can go right ahead. Otherwise, I'm happy to move on. Yeah, let's let's give people a minute to digest and see. I know I already have like three questions for you, but I'm saving them for the end. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't see anybody saying speak, so I think you can go ahead. Great, thanks. Oh, wait, sorry, Sully. Let's get to Sully here. Sully Billingsley has a question. Go ahead, Sully, you should be able to unmute. Hi, hey, how's it going? Um, thanks for giving this talk. Um, whenever you were talking about filtering out noise, um, I know that uh, there's some studies done at the LHC to possibly do um, background filtering with neural networks and other machine learning techniques. Have you looked into uh, to doing something like this? That's Yeah, that's a great point. It's something we're starting to think about for sure because we're in a position where um, you know, we're not like the LIGO collaboration where we've got a, we've got a detector that we can take apart piece by piece and characterize all sources of noise. We've got astrophysical objects that are forming um, the most crucial part of our, our detection process. So we will have effective noise models, but we're never going to have complete noise models. And if we don't care about characterizing the noise at all, then neural networks, machine learning could be the way to go. But there is rich physics encoded in the noise, um, physics associated with the neutron stars and the interstellar medium. So, um, so we, try to, we try to characterize all parts of that. So we'll probably take a dual approach um, where we try to characterize it on one hand, but also just try to filter it out. Okay, that's interesting. So you would use the neural networks whenever you're trying to effectively not pay any attention to the noise. That's my feeling. We haven't actually done a lot of work on this. We're only starting to move into this space of machine learning right now. Um, but I think that's that's the way we would go. We would just try to do some sort of deep filtering process um, with a neural network and just try to get rid of anything 
it doesn't look correlated between the pulse stars. Okay, interesting. Thank you. Sure. All right. I think you're good to go, Stephen. Great. Thank you. Yeah. So let me now launch to what um, what a detection could look like if um, if this nanogram result does um, does hold water. So this is a project that was um, actually led by my postdoc, Dr. Nihan Paul. Um, in a nutshell, it's what to expect when you're expecting to detect a signal. Uh, so what we took was, um, we took the nanograph 12 and a half year data set. We took its noise properties and we emulated a data set of similar sensitivity and then forecasted observations up to 20 years total. So we essentially took 12 and a half years of data and we forecasted up to 20 years we didn't add any new pulsars. Um, now, nanograph seems to be adding about five or six pulsars per year, which is really going to help with, de with detection. But um, we wanted to see how well we could do just using status quo observations. So we didn't add new pulsars. What you're seeing here is the recovery of this ups and downs cross-correlated signature in different snapshots of the data, going from 12 to 15, um, and then actually my zoom is hiding what the last one is, but it's, um, it's more than 15 years where it's characterizing this Hellings and Downs quadrupolar pattern very, very well. And there are two figures of merit on here that, um, that you should notice. One is rho hat, and that's a measure of the total signal to noise ratio. Um, and then the other is rho HD, which is simply a measure of the cross correlated signal between distinct pairings of pulsars. So we will get some signal of correlations of pulsars with themselves. Um, there is a signature of gravitational waves purely in that. But if we want to declare detection, then we have to build that on evidence for cross correlations between distinct pulsars. So that's what RUHD is measuring. It's the figure of merit that's important for detection, but actually the figure of merit that's important for scientific milestones, how well we can measure properties of the background that will be based on the total signal. Um, a lot of the information is actually encoded in the autocorrelations of pulsars with themselves. And that's what we can do right here. Um, we can probe the sort of multipolar structure of these cross correlations between, between different pulsars. Um, this is similar in, in idea to measuring the multipolar structure of the CMB. Um, this is really trying to tackle whether we're seeing the quadrupolar pattern we expect or whether there's noise um, from monopole and dipole noise processes. So we expect the Hellings and Downs curve, which is induced by gravitational waves to be mostly quadrupolar, which is going to be at L equals two. There'll be a little bit in octopole and beyond, but by and large, it's, it's quadrupolar. Noise processes will be monopole and dipole. We don't know of anything that will be quadrupolar and beyond for noise. Um, but it's important that we characterize the entire multipolar structure here and say whether um, we truly have gravitational waves or not. And we have these robust templates uh, to guide us. So we know um, how to characterize the multipolar structure and say whether we actually have this Hellington dance curve. Now say we have, we actually have a dipole correlated noise process or a monopole correlated process. Even if it's noise that we have in our data and we apply a template of Hellings and Downs cross correlations, you're still going to get some measure of signal. You're still going to get some signal to noise uh, because there is going to be overlap of your template, you know, an incorrect template and your noise because you've got noise and you've got finite stretches of data. But as time goes on and as our data gets more and more informative, these um, mismatches between template and, and noise will just flatten out. And if we've got a true signal, it will grow in expectations with, um, with our scaling relationships. So we know what to expect. Uh, our detection is not simply going to be based on surpassing some signal to noise threshold. It's going to be watching how our detection statistics grow slowly over time and making sure they're in line with our expectations. Uh, beyond simply detection, we want to characterize the stochastic background because it gives us a lot of information about the black hole binary population. Um, these are showing some general purpose uh, parameter uncertainty scaling laws that will help us characterize uh, how well we can measure the amplitude of the stochastic background and also its spectral index. Um, so we expect a supermassive 
black hole binary background to have a certain amplitude, a certain spectral index. Actually, theoretically, alpha here should be minus two thirds for a population of supermassive black hole binaries. So we have good expectations built on solid theoretical foundations for what these different parameters should be. And we can substitute in any different array we want and any different choices of noise and pulsars to just plug those values into this relationship and say how well we can start characterizing these parameters into the future. And it's important that we do parameterize and, and recover these, these uh, factors in the future because like I said, they encode lots of rich information about the astrophysics of, uh, of the supermassive black hole population. The overall amplitude of the background, which um, I'm just showing a cartoon spectrum here that's in blue, juxtaposed with uh, a sensitivity spectrum from Nanograv from a few years ago. The overall amplitude at higher frequencies of this background encodes information about massive black hole host galaxy scaling relationships like MM bulge or M sigma. Um, and those are hotly contested at the moment. Um, we can also extract information about the merger rate of massive black holes. This, that's a very poorly known theoretical quantity. Um, and so we would like to be able to measure that with gravitational waves. A really, really fascinating prospect happens at lower frequencies. If we can probe lower in frequencies, then really we're seeing binaries that are at wider orbital separations, um, just through Kepler's law. Um, if we're probing binaries at wider orbital separations, then they might still actually be in dynamical contact with the wider galactic environment. So they might be interacting with stars or even circumbinary gaseous disks that could drive their evolution stronger than gravitational waves. So that will change the shape of the spectrum and create this nice little turnover at lower frequencies that we can look for. So if we find evidence of a turnover at some frequency and we can characterize the slope of that lower frequency spectrum, we can start to say something about the subparsec dynamical interactions of supermassive black hole binaries. Now, if you'd like to learn more about um, these astrophysics milestones for pulsar timing arrays uh, that appeared in the archive um, a few weeks ago, led by, like I said, Dr. Mian Paul. Now, uh, the last section of, of this talk will be what I see as the future of multi-messenger astronomy and where PTAs could be going um, at the end of this decade and the start of the next. PTAs probe black holes that are very different from what LIGO can probe. LIGO is probing stellar mass black holes um, around which you don't expect any material to lie. So there shouldn't be any material really lying around the black holes that LIGO detects. But that's not true for pulsar timing arrays because supermassive black holes are lying in galaxy centers. And a lot of material gets channeled towards galaxy centers after the merger of two galaxies. And that can form these very nice circumbinary disks, which can actually form features below that scale and form these mini disks. So what you're seeing in this uh, video um, is actually a circumbinary disk, and then it's got two black holes in the center, each of which is surrounded by a mini disk. Um, and you get these accretion streams that actually feed these mini disks. Um, and the accretion variability can create luminosity variations that act in tune with the orbit of the, the binary. So accretion variations can actually potentially produce periodic variations in uh, light curves of AGM that might be related to the orbital period of the binary. So if we can look for such periodic signatures and also do a gravitational wave search, then we might be able to have a really powerful multi-messenger probe of the most massive black holes in the universe. And there are two possible ways we can get to uh, multi-messenger detection of black holes with PTAs. The first is that PTAs will detect the gravitational waves first. And that will give very broad sky localization, hundreds to maybe a thousand square degrees. And that's quite big. Um, after that, we'll need to go to galaxy catalogs, try to match up potential host galaxies with this signature. We'll need some sort of ranking criteria based on the mass of the galaxy, its potential to host a binary, things like that. Um, and if we can narrow down the number of galaxies to a reasonable number, a few hundred potentially, uh, within this sky localization box, then we can go and do targeted photometric follow-up 
and look for these periodic fluctuations in the, uh, the light curves of the centers of the galaxies. The other possibility is that we take some binary candidates that already exist and we do targeted PTA searches. So there are already a large number of um, supermassive black hole binary candidates that have been found in large synoptic time domain surveys. Um, so a perfect example of that would be the Catalina Real-Time Transient Survey, the Zwicky Transient Facility, Palomar. There are lots of these time domain campaigns. But an exciting prospect for the next 10 years will be the uh, Legacy Survey of Space and Time by uh, the Vera Rubin Observatory. And that's going to be a fantastic instrument to try to search for these periodic uh, active galactic nuclei. So if we can collect a large number of these candidates, we know exactly where they are. And so we can do targeted gravitational wave searches with PTAs. So it's really just an, a difference in the order of operation, but hopefully that will ultimately lead to uh, EM and gravitational wave detection of these systems. This is uh, showing a, a potential outcome of this that's been uh, led by uh, another of my postdocs, Dr. Maria Carisi. Uh, Lisa has been, um, people have been searching for this prospect in LISA data analysis. There's been quite a lot of methodology developed there. And we're trying to develop this methodology for pulsar timing arrays, where um, if you have some sort of accretion disk structure around, um, around the black holes, then the electromagnetic re radiation can be Doppler boosted. So as one mini disk comes towards you, it'll be Doppler boosted. The other will be a Doppler boosted in the opposite sense. So you'll see these periodic fluctuations in the electromagnetic radiation from these systems. And that could be tracked in tune with the gravitational wave signal you expect from these systems. And you can use both of these signatures together and really build a full multi-messenger portrait of the binary system. And they seem to have uh, complementary functional dependencies. So gravitational waves and electromagnetic radiation give information, excuse me, gravitational waves and electromagnetic waves um, give information that could be quite covariant, but if you stack them on top of each other or do some sort of combined search, you actually reduce by a large amount the amount of um, parameter space that can be consistent with the signal. So it's very important that we fuse these data sets together and try to do a multi-messenger search. Before I finish, I wanted to highlight some other work being done by some of my students. Uh, Joanna Wang is uh, an undergraduate student that has been doing robust time series outlier isolation in these kinds of photometric and PTA searches for supermassive black hole binaries. So this is very important that we assess the quality of our data and whether any um, noise processes or outlier inducing processes are contaminated in our data. And so she's built a really nice scheme for that. Uh, my other student, um, Katie Sella, has been working with a, a close colleague of mine, Luke Kelly, on tracking potential host galaxy characteristics of black hole binaries that could be detectable by PTAs. So it's important that we understand what the hosts of supermassive black hole binaries will look like. And to do that, Katie has been looking in the illustrious cosmological simulation, um, which allows you to track the host galaxy properties uh, alongside the black hole properties of their centers. So that's been a really powerful way of, of looking at the demography of these kinds of galaxies and building expectations uh, of what they should look like, which will eventually filter down to making ranking criteria for any galaxies that happen to be in a PTA sky localization box. And that's all. I'd like to finish by saying that it's been a pleasure. Um, pulsar timing arrays are the only gravitational wave instrument that can detect the most massive black holes in the universe um, at nanohertz frequencies. And if this new nanograv result is hinting at a gravitational wave background, then not just detection, but full characterization of uh, that spectrum and the population could be within a few years. And that could be expedited by fusing the data sets together um, within the International Pulsar Timing Array. So the road beyond detection is going to tell us a lot of information about supermassive black hole binaries, uh, the entire population and how they interact. And as I said, in the last few moments there, PTAs could detect a multi-messenger supermassive binary black hole system, which would be sort of uh, you know, the ultimate example of gravitational waves and EM working together to characterize a system. Thank you very much. 
Yeah, thank you very much, Stephen. And I'm going to try to give you um, a little applause here at the end. <laughs> thank you very much. That's great. All right. So, of course, we are now open for questions here during the general Q&A at the end. Again, if you want to get in the speaker queue, just type the word speak in the chat. I'll give you a few seconds to do that. And uh, while I'm stalling for time, uh, I'll think of, I'll pull one of my questions off my list just in case. All right, uh, Joel, yes, you have a question. Go ahead. Hi there, Stephen. Yeah, thanks a lot for that great talk. That was, that was excellent. Um, you mentioned the spectral index of the background of gravitational waves produced by supermassive black holes uh, is expected to be minus two thirds. Is there a simple reason to understand why that's the, the factor? Yeah, so it's, it's based mostly on um, how gravitational waves cause binaries to evolve. And that's theoretically you know, very well known from GR. So we can, we can do this calculation in the back of an envelope. It's just what the sort of rate of orbital period change caused by gravitational waves and the quadrupolar radiation that comes from them, um, how that evolves over time. So it's not a, a long drawn out calculation. I would, I would try to sketch it on Zoom if I, if I had time, but um, it, is, it is pretty simple and it's, it's very robust. Great. That sounds okay. like a, a good tease for something you could do in a lecture, Joel, hint, hint. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, I, I do this with my students. So um, if you'd like some notes, uh, I can send you them. <laughs> Great. Sounds good. Thank you. Yeah, very cool. All right. I, I'm still waiting to see if anybody else wants to ask a question. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use my co-host prerogative and ask one. I have a really naive question for you, Stephen. So I, I was fascinated by the idea, but I missed the details when you said mm -hmm. it. So you said that you had one of the pulsars uh, out of your 45 that showed a transient noise feature. And, and I, I got kind of fascinated by the idea, but missed the detail. I think you said something about a, 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 an empty pocket in the interstellar medium that might have caused this. How, how do you, what was it? What do you think it was? And how do you know that? Yeah, this is um, this is a really fun example of um, you know getting into the weeds of noise modeling. Um, we can we can track the the dispersion measure, which is a measure of the electron density along the line of sight, um, because we observe the pulsars at multiple radio frequencies. So we can tell how much lower radio frequencies are delayed with respect to higher radio frequencies. And if we do that over time, um, we can track that you know these kinds of trends and what appears it appears that at some point maybe five years ago this pulsar had a very sharp decrease in that dispersion measure uh, which is indicating that the electron density suddenly dropped and um, we associate that with some sort of empty pocket or a void it recovered so maybe just a cloud passed by and a cloud of interstellar stuff um, passed by and you know and then passed back over again but what's interesting is that it seems to have happened again. It's not periodic because we wouldn't expect it to be necessarily periodic. This is just fluctuations in the interstellar medium. But it unfortunately happened toward the end of our data set such that it's really, really influencing how well we characterize noise at low frequencies. Um, so it's unfortunate that we, we seem to have another of these voids in this pulsar, uh, in this pulsar's timing. Um, it will take a year or two for it to recover. And um, you know, there are positive signs so far from data that's been extended beyond this analysis. Um, but what's interesting as well that I mentioned is we just chop off the end of this pulsar's data where it doesn't have this transient feature. It does seem to support this common process. And that's indicated by a little hollow green dot on the far right here. Um, which is that pulsar, it's kind of difficult to see, we need to work on our image aesthetics, but it's, it's showing that if we just chop off that data, um, the pulsar does seem to have support for this common spectrum process. And again, these kinds of transient phenomena, they aren't fundamentally a problem, except insofar as they cause you to maybe chop data out of your data set, because they shouldn't lead to these cross correlations across 
angular exactly. scales that you were talking about, exactly. that, that uh, quadrupolar effect that you were talking about. Unless, exactly, yeah. unless you're extremely unlucky and somehow the noise conspires to do this, right? But presumably the odds ratio for that is vanishing, vanishingly. I'd imagine so, yeah. We are talking about big angular scales and quite different environments for the pulsars throughout the galaxy. You can imagine though that there could be common environmental factors if the pulsars were in like a globular cluster. Um, but we none of our pulsars satisfy that. But it's an interesting um, it's an interesting question. Yeah. No, but I I I I guess maybe a kind of a follow-up to that dispersion question. So the do the help me out here, and again, I apologize for this, the naivete of my question. The gravitational waves, they they don't affect the dispersion of the pulses, or they do? They don't affect the dispersion of the pulses. Okay. They, so, they don't affect, you know, they, they equally affect all of the radio frequencies in the pulse. Okay. Yeah, that's what I thought I understood from yeah. the early part of your talk and from like previous gravitational wave presentations. The reason I ask that is then that you really can tell the difference between a cloud of electrons passing through the line of sight and a gravitational Absolutely. wave event because one yeah. of those will affect the dispersion and the timing and the other one will only affect the timing, presumably. Absolutely, yeah. And we've, you know, we've been careful about this. We couldn't tell them apart if, um, well, we couldn't tell them apart in a spectral sense mm -hmm. un uh, unless we measure the radio pulses at several radio frequencies so we can actually disentangle these influences. Right. And that's something we have been very careful about. If you go back to data that's like 20 years old, then there has not been that. There might be sort of just observations that are at one radio frequency and we can't really disentangle um, for, uh, within that data. But modern data is, is very good in that sense. Okay. Um, I'm gonna ask one more question just to buy anybody time in case they're, they're waiting to the last minute to ask their question. Um, I'm kind of a fan for statistics, but I'm no expert. Can we go back to your Bayesian odds ratio slide? Oh, sure. Where you also talked, I think, about p-values. Um, sure. I guess, yeah, okay, I guess that was the next slide. Okay, so, well, I'm actually, I'm kind of curious about the relationship between these two because I'm a little rusty on my Bayesian statistics and I'm trying to figure out how do you go from, say, the p-value to the odds ratio or vice versa, or are they completely separate statistical calculations within this framework? This is a this is a great question um, because this is kind of a um, a union of two things that don't belong together. Um, p values and base factors are not related to each other. Yeah. Um, okay. But so you, can't, you can't go from five to ten percent p value where the noise explains the signal to that odds ratio you had on the other slide. That's not correct. Yeah. yeah. Okay. What okay. we're what we're saying here is that um, the base factor is simply what we're using as our detection statistic. And so if we use that as our detection statistic within a frequentist measurement of um, the significance of the signal, we can compute a p-value because we can do lots and lots of these scrambling operations mm -hmm. and measure the base factor each time. Right. And we see that in five to 10% of the time, noise fluctuations alone can produce a base factor louder than what we actually measured. So it's, it's sort of a way of us calibrating what our base factors actually mean. Formally, they are a measure of sort of the betting odds, but um, if we want to convince people in the community that we have detected something, we need to have a good calibration and an understanding of, of our base factors and what they actually correspond to. So this is sort of our, our way of saying, um, okay, if you don't like base factors, then we've got a p-value of five to 10%. Well, I am curious because, you know, in our community, we, we don't really quote things like Bayes factors or odds ratios. And so I'm, I'm curious just to understand what is the threshold for definitive detection in an odds ratio sense? So if we go back to the two to four odds ratio that you showed, what would that have to be to be definitive? Like we, we are absolutely detecting a quadrupolar effect and not noise. It's very problem specific, but um, we have... Through, through plenty of discussion and simulations, um, we're at the stage where we would say that something with odds greater than 100 to one, um, 100 to one in favor of these quadrupolar mm -hmm. cross correlations, that would be definitive evidence. Okay. Um, and we can actually we can actually relate the Bayesian odds ratio to the signal to noise ratio. So that's uh, 100 to one is actually only a signal to noise ratio of about three. 
oh. which doesn't sound like a lot, but that is a, that is supported entirely by cross correlations and lots of pulsars. And we expect that signal to noise ratio to grow very, very quickly over time. So three is sort of our, our threshold for when we start paying attention. And then we can grow, see how that grows into the future and make sure that it's growing in expectations um, for our scaling relationships for gravitational waves. Okay. Yeah. So basically, once you think you've seen something definitive, at that point, new information kicks in because you know how it's supposed to scale if it really exactly. is. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. That's really quite clever, actually. I, I like that very much. Um, all right. Well, I, I don't see any more questions. This will be your last chance or forever on this talk, at least hold your peace. All right, I don't see anyone clamoring, so let's thank Stephen one more time. And uh, we really appreciate you taking the time to do this. Um, thanks very much, and we'll wish you a good evening. Stay safe. Uh, you know, there in, I presume you're at Vanderbilt at this point. Yes, that's right. Yeah, I'm actually at home, but um, yeah. I will try to stay safe. <laughs> yeah, hypothetically, you're thank in you very much. Yeah. Vanderbilt, yeah. though. Yeah, okay. No, thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. It's been a yeah, pleasure. Take care, everybody, and have a good evening, okay? Bye bye. All right, bye bye.